turning uh, 29 years old, so <laughs> relax. <laughs> and uh, you know, for the campus people, they're saying I'm getting old, but for a lot of you, you're saying, man, you're super young. Um, but the Bible does say in Acts 20, 35, that it is better to give than to receive. Uh, so I'm excited that this is a great gift from the Lord that I get to give to the church today and get a chance to preach this morning. Uh, Acts 13, verse 22. We see the Holy Spirit pre uh, speaking to the, to the prophet Paul. Verse 22, the Bible says, After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. You know, we're studying out the book of Samuel, and this passage over here really recaps everything we just studied out these past couple weeks. If you're a guest here, we've been studying out 1 Samuel. And over here it said that God rejected that King Saul, but he needed a new man. And that man was a man after God's own heart. You know, what's amazing about us even here in this room, God wants his own people. He wants a people that are going to be after his heart. And the Bible clearly teaches us what does it mean to be a man or a woman after God's own heart. It means to do whatever God tells you to do. And that was King David. But that needs to be us. That needs to be every single man, every single woman that stepped in these doors. We want to be a people after God's own heart. And that's the title of my lesson here this morning, a people after God's own heart. Let's now go to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 16. I got to say we've had an incredible service so far. And it's great to see Nick here. Uh, Nick just graduated from UCLA, man. And you, you got to appreciate that sold out. Right there. Graduating just went straight to church. Still got the garbs on. Uh, so congratulations to all our graduates. And especially Ace, man, 4.0. That's, that's something to, to really boast to the Lord about. You know, what's amazing about being people after God's own heart. 1 John 3 verse 1 says, See what grace... Or see what great love the Father has lavished on us. That we should be called children of God, and that it is what, that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. You know, God wants a people, but God really wants children. God wants children after his own heart. And I hope this morning, where well, I can convince you through this lesson, that you can truly see God, your heavenly Father, as your Father. And you can see the great love that he has for you, no matter what happened in your life. Good, bad, or ugly, you can see God's been working in your life since the day you were born, even before you were born. But now he wants you to be a man or a woman after his own heart. And we, we looked at what that means. It means to do whatever God says. But I think sometimes with our physical fathers, when they give us different uh, direction, you know, the famous line is when you ask, well, why do you want me to do this? Well, they made shirts about it, because that said so. And uh, that's, what, that's what most people say when, or most of our parents say, when they can't explain why they want you to do something. But you know what? God's a lot different. We can look at this scripture over here in Proverbs 3, verse 1. The Bible says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. You see, God gives you direction not just because he said so, because if you actually do what he says, you're going to have peace and prosperity, and you'll one day be in heaven. So that's the reason God wants you to be a man or a woman after his own heart, or a child after their father's heart, because it'll give you peace if you do that. You know, as I said earlier, we're studying out Samuel, and last week, uh, Matthew preached a lesson called Stand in Awe. And now it's from chapter 12, chapter 15, and we saw, sadly, because of the rebellion of Saul, God had to reject him as king. And don't forget our three themes of the book of Samuel, our three major themes. Number one, God opposes the proud but raises the humble. Number two, despite human evil, God is always working. And number three, God is raising up a messianic king, that is King Jesus, that's going to have a kingdom forever. 
And in 1 Samuel 16, we're going to start a very exciting study about a man who has 66 chapters devoted to him in the Bible. Compared to 14 that for Abraham, 11 for Joseph, and 11 for Jacob. This is a man of passion, a man who loved God, a man who had many blunders and mistakes, but always got back up. A man after God's own heart, that man is King David. And for our first point today, chosen by our Father. First Samuel 16, verse 1. Let's get into the, are you guys ready for a Bible study here? Because if you are a guest, we love the Bible here. We love to get into the script. Today, I pray, before you have some meal with your fathers, that you get a meal from your Heavenly Father. And that this Bible study really feeds you spiritually and you can leave filled with God's words. 1 Samuel 16. Are you guys there? Hallelujah. Amen. TJ's fired up. How hungry. All right, verse 1. Let's do it. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I've rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way, and I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about this, he will kill me. See some idolatry there. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I'll show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. Shout out to all the short kings there. For I have rejected him. The, the Lord does not... Look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are, there, are these all your sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. He will not sit, we will not sit down until he arrives. So he went for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome futures. And the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day, from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. You know, it's amazing right here. We see it's like a movie. The anointing of King David. And it's the first time David's mentioned in all the scriptures. And we see some insights on being chosen by our fathers. Over here we see that Samuel comes, and there's eight different sons that are there, and he sees seven of them pass by. And Samuel says, God did not choose any of them. And he saw a really tall guy, probably reminded him of Saul. So, you know, we, we're grateful that you don't, you don't have to be tall to be chosen by our father here. So, but if you're also tall, you also don't have to be disqualified like Saul. So that's also okay. But what, but what, what happens over here that these were the people that they looked like they're, they're supposed to be the chosen people, but it really shows that God is special. God can look at your heart. None of us can do that. Do you understand? God can see me right now. The Bible says that the Lord knows every single thing you're thinking about right now. He knows your heart. And what's amazing about that is we see something special about David when he was chosen. He was tending the sheep. And really, he was the least likely person to be chosen by our father. But isn't it so amazing to be chosen? Isn't it so awesome? I remember when you're in elementary school and they're picking teams for basketball or for kickball. Then it sucked for some of us when you got picked, when you got picked last. Oh. Or you didn't get picked at all. Oh. 
But for those who got picked first, you felt good. But you know what's awesome here this morning? God wants to choose you first. And they said the last will be first. God wants to choose you. He's your father. He loves you. He wants to use you just like how he used King David. Isn't that incredible? But he was the least likely guy to be chosen. You know what it says about us, well, as disciples? We're the lowly. The least likely. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31. You have to turn there, but just jot it down. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 to 30. Let me read it for you. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So that no one may boast before him is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That, that passage is encouraging, but also a little like, okay. What are you trying to say here about me? You calling me stupid or what? <laughs> but the Bible here says that it chose the lowly things. Consider what you were when you were called. I don't know if anyone here was of noble birth. I don't know if anyone here was, you know, their, their, their dad or their mom was a king. And the Bible here says God chose the lowly things. The weak things, the foolish things. The Bible says we're fools for Christ. To despise those who think they're something. Because you could bring this Bible to anybody. I don't care if they're the president of the United States. I don't care if they're an NBA basketball player. I don't care if they're an engineer or a philosopher. It doesn't matter. When you bring the word of God to someone, it's going to show them who they really are. And God wants to choose you this morning. To be that individual, to be that vessel. Because God is powerful, he's amazing, but he needs a vessel. If Noah didn't build the ark, there'll be no salvation for the eight people. If the apostles didn't, didn't answer the call to evangelize the world, there'll be no salvation for those people. If you didn't answer the call to see that God chose you as a father, he picked you, he loves you, he wants to use you. That's who we are, and that's the amazing thing about being a disciple. You're chosen by your father. And I believe because he saw his heart, not his appearance. And there's something so special about David's heart. You know, I, I did a personal study on this. There's probably so much more you can look at. But I want to look at five chosen character traits. Five chosen character traits that we see in David. Number one, we see a nevertheless attitude. That means great faith. You know, there's, an issue, there's a, a time where he becomes king. And they said, there's no way this guy is going to be able to come, come into Jerusalem. And then the Bible next sentence says, nevertheless, just got in there. Against all odds, David believed the Lord. That's what you need for, to be a chosen man or woman. Great faith. And we know how we have great faith. Get into the word of God. No limits. Number two, he was sacrificial. You know, there's, it says in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 3, when they're building this temple that was baptized in gold, the Bible says about David that he went above and beyond what was needed. That was his heart. No limits. Sacrificial. Number three, integrity. He was able to be trusted. Psalm 70, verse 72. But not just integrity and a great heart, but the man was skillful. You know, most likely during the time when David was anointed over here, he was 10 or 15 years old. And we know that for 15 years, he had to be on the run from Saul and was not actually king. So he was anointed king, but wasn't king until 15 years later. So it really shows us that God doesn't choose those who are prepared. He prepares those who are chosen. And, and, he, wanted, and he had a, a plan. Most likely what I believe from my study, David most likely, as it said, that last sentence, he might have missed this, said, then Samuel went to Ramah. Ramah was where the company of prophets were at. And that's where Samuel had his school. Most likely what David did, he went to that school to learn how to be a prophet. To learn how to do what God wanted him to do. And that's where you learn that skill. But even before that, at a tender age of 10 and 15, he was a shepherd. He had an incredible heart for the sheep. That's why he loved God's people. He was not just he had a great heart, but he had skill. He knew what he was doing. But finally, he was humble. First Chronicles 29 verse 14, the Bible says that about David. He says, who am I? 
And who am I? Who's my family? That we get to be chosen. If you want to be chosen, because the Bible says many are called. I believe that if you came to service today, you've been called by God. God has a message for you to today. But it says many are called, but few are chosen. Even today, some people will hear this message, but go through deaf ears. Don't hear me. It's not about me. It's not about who the guys who are preaching. It's about the word of God. Do you hear the voice of God today? He wants to choose you today. He wants to do something awesome in your life. But you got to listen. You got to be attentive because God is your father. He wants to choose you. Amen. You know, thank God for our fathers, our physical fathers. You know, it's great to hear, you know, you know I love the Hoaglands. I love Jim Fenton and his family. What an incredible community and contribution they share. Let's give it up for, for Jim and Jesse and Lindsay. And it's so awesome to have loving fathers. But here's the sad truth. Some of us didn't have that. You know, I looked, looked at some stats here. 17.8 uh, million children, nearly one in four in America, did not grow, grow up with a father. And you see all the, the, the risk and the things that happen with an absent father. But even some for those that their father was there, there was a study on child maltreatment. In the United States, neglect accounts for 78% of all child mistreatment. More than physical, sexual, and psychological abuse. And neglect is more effective on someone's psyche than even the other abuses. And sadly, that's the reality. Even some of us today, Father's Day can be a hard time. Because you can think about your past with your father. Why is it so hard for some people to believe that your heavenly father is choosing you? Because their own physical father has rejected them. And they, you put, and we put our physical father's face on God. But I want to convince you today, a couple passages, you can jot them down. Psalm 68, verse 5, the Bible says God is the father to the fatherless. Numbers 23, 19, and Hebrews 6, 17, and 19. The Bible says that God does not lie. God does not lie. Do you believe that when you read this book? He doesn't lie to you. He's not, he's not trying to trick you. He doesn't want to reject you. He doesn't lie. He always says the truth. Do you believe that? That's your father. That's your real dad. That's who you serve. And he wants to choose you. And what's amazing is God has enough love for the whole world. For all time. That's, that's just, that we can't even fathom that love. But I really want to encourage us today. God wants to choose you. But will you choose him? Wasn't Saul chosen? Wasn't Saul anointed? But he rejected God. And God is holy. So therefore, he had to reject Saul. But we see the incredible heart of a man who has a heart after God's own. What does that mean? That he, his heart beats in rhythm with God. And because of that, he was chosen by his father. And I want to encourage you today, that could be you. All you got to do is get into the word. You may not see God physically, but he's right here, guys. He could hug you through this. He could love you through this. You could feel his love. You could see his love. You can not just feel or see, you can have a conviction. Be fully convinced that God loves you because we are chosen by our father. Let's continue reading. Now in verse 14. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 14. So there's a contrast. Verse 13, Spirit of the Lord comes powerfully upon David. What's the next scripture? Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. It's like a movie. You see David... Then it pans to Saul. 
It's just like you, you can't imagine how that may feel. Yeah. God's spirit, you can imagine. Like you, you felt that. You had that protection. And what happens then? An evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. What may say, how can God create evil? We have to understand this passage. We understand later on what happens is David then is hired to play music for him. And we see what happens when you really worship God or have great music. It could heal someone's heart. That's why we appreciate our song leaders. You, 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 can't, you can't sing songs hot, uh, with, with the hard heart. You know what I mean, if you're a man, we start singing, you're, you're, you're going to get fired up here. But some of us, some of us, we, you know, I think one, we got to make sure we have songs. But some of us, we got to learn the songs. But some of us, you may be struggling. And you can tell when someone's not doing so well spiritually. If they're not singing, there's something up with that spirit right there. And if you can tell, every time I'm singing over here, I'm always looking around. I want to see. we got a sour face today. And this evil spirit, let's just, just, just deeper, we're not going to go so deep into this theological understanding of the evil spirit from the Lord. This is the way I see it. The spirit protects us, but then once the spirit departed, showing that someone could fall away, someone could be a baptized disciple, have the spirit of God, and then it could leave them. John 10 says that no one can take away your, fal- your salvation, but you can forfeit it yourself. And that protects us, the spirit. But when we have no more protection, now we can be subjected to evil spirits. It's like caging a pit bull. Right? That cage protects you. Pit bull, you know, some of them, I mean, some of them are really nice, but some of them will tear you apart. So the spirit is like that cage. But when that cage is lifted and the spirit is no longer there, you could be tormented by evil spirits. But thank God there's healing. Saul sought after temporary he- healing, but we know we have healing in the blood of Jesus. <laughs> now we're going to go into a very exciting study. Probably one of the most famous stories of the Bible. We're going to look at David and Goliath. <laughs> now, here's our point, and what I believe is really the point of this story. Our Father gives us strength. So, verses 1 to 3, we're going to summarize it. The scene is there in the Valley of Elah. And you have David. And or you have the Israelites, and you have the Goliath and the Philistines. And we know what happens because prior to this, I believe Matt preached on it, Saul did have a great victory against the Philistines. But you see, and you can read at times, like, wow, like, was God patient at all with Saul? God, God was very patient. This right now is 27 years later. And now the Philistines have gathered their strength once again, and now they want to fight the Israelites. Let's see what happens. God our Father gives us strength. 1 Samuel 17, verse 4. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out from the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. Don't forget that span right there. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and wore a coat of scale armor and a bronze, a, a, a scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's wand, or whatever that means. And his iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not the servants of Saul? No, servants of God. Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now David was the son of an Ephraimite named Jesse who's from Bethlehem and Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and Saul signed who's very old. All right? Probably not 29. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The first born is Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. Drop down now to verse 16. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Our father gives us strength. You know, it's amazing here we're introduced to probably one of the most famous enemies in the Bible, Goliath. And he was six cubits tall and a span. That was translated to nine foot nine. 
the NBA would love this guy. <laughs> and, he, and he's wearing armor that had, it was over 200 pounds. And I believe, as we know, the Old Testament is a physical foreshadowing of a spiritual reality. And this is what I've studied out, and this is what I believe. It might be a little fresh look at the scripture, but this is what I believe. There's some numerology in the scripture. So we can look at this. It says that he was six cubits tall. He also... What, he had a weaver's rod or a shaft that weighed 600 shekels. And if you count his armor, he had six different pieces of armor. What's that number? 666. The mark of the beast. He's so, po- supposed to represent Satan. He wore armor like a scale. What's a scale? A serpent. Every day and every night. 40 days. So take pictures of that, but I have another slide for you. So, okay, he represents the dark forces. 40. It says for 40 days he did this. I believe 40 represents testing the scriptures. 40 days, Jesus was tempted by who? By Satan. 40 days, Elijah fasted. 40 days, Moses fasted. 40 years in the wilderness. I believe 40 supposed to represent testing. As Revelation 12 says, day and night, Satan, our accuser, accuses us day and night. What was happening? If you also read in Chronicles or even Leviticus, morning and evening, they will lay down sacrifices. So what's happening? Goliath, at the time of the sacrifice, is going before God's people, and he is tempting them. He is testing them. He is taunting them. Isn't that how it is when we're sacrificing? Is that how it began? Well, I'm sacrificing so much and I can see nothing for it. And you start listening to the voice of Satan, and that was Goliath. Forty straight days, and the people were being tested, but they failed to test. What is your Goliath? What is your Goliath? What is your Goliath? Is it a character trait that you know you have to change? He's like, it's too much. God doesn't lie. Anybody can change. Is it our relationships? Is it raising? Whatever. Or right now, well, I can tell you Goliath right now. We're in special missions contribution right now. <laughs> and that could be a Goliath. Some of it might be our finances. I pre- so appreciate Jesse and Lindsay. Like, come on, guys. You see that? I be coast. How can you look at that? Like, can I you have a heart to give to special missions? We can see that maybe as a Goliath, but really it's a small thing for the Lord. And really I want to encourage us that God wants to blow it on out. And we got to take it personal. I, I love what Jesse shared. This is our family. And some of us, we may never meet these people until we get to heaven. But it's going to be worth it. God's going to give you strength to do it. And I appreciate all the disciples doing what they need to do. My wife, she's been going out selling brownies. And man, my wife, she's going she gonna to sell you some brownies. You might not even want the brownies, but you're going to just buy them because you're like, man, just, I feel compelled. <laughs> you know, I can say no to Regine. My wife is persuasive. <laughs> I appreciate the Marys sacrificing financially. I know it's not easy. I, I appreciate the campus. You don't have a lot of money, so you just find it. <laughs> right? we, just, we, just, we, just, we go to the streets. And it just, it sounds like a terrible plan, honestly. But it's incredibly lucrative. <laughs> this is personal, guys. This is our Goliath right now for, for June, our special missions contribution. We have thousands of dollars to raise at the Super Region. But let me just, so you know, just lie. Here's some of the people that are being sent out. Thrashers, the Hughes, Brandon, Daniela, Kwaku, and Ashley. These people are uprooting their lives to go preach the word of God. This is our family. You're going to find the money for the family. I want to God's going to give us strength. But even so, if you don't know these people, just look at this. That's our church. You wouldn't be here without special missions. So how dare we not sacrifice for the others? We are standing on the shoulders of many men and women who came before us, who slung that stone at that Goliath. 
Give it 10 timers, 20 times, doesn't matter. He said, we're going to answer that call because there's souls all around the world that need to hear about God. So that's good life, but now let's look at David. All right, we're going to read a bunch here, so stick with me. Let's now go to verse 25. Verse 25, Bible says, Now the Israelites have been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the man standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this, this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeat to him what they have been saying and told them, this will happen, be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the, with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom do you leave these few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked, how your, wicked your heart is. You come down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done? said David. Can I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before to someone else and brought the same matter, and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. So let's stop right there. David comes on the scene. And he's like, guys, what, what, what's going on? Like, who's this uncircumcised Philistine, man? Like, why, why is he talking so much? And then he says, like, what, what's going to happen? If someone does something, tell him what's going to happen pretty good like no taxes sounds pretty solid but really it was really about making God's name great then here comes the older brother and he's like oh David you're just conceited can he see his heart nope he wasn't conceited he was just confident he was confident in God but sometimes when you get confident in the Lord people say you're arrogant oh you're conceited no, no, no. We come here in the name of Jesus Christ. And we know because who is really inside of us, we have a godly confidence. And we believe what God says is true. We believe that God wants a church that grows. We believe that God wants to raise up leaders. We believe that God wants to see every nation be saved. That's godly confidence. That's not conceit. It was once said, haters don't really hate you. They hate themselves. Because you're a, a reflection of what they wish to be. He just was ticked off. He wasn't the guy that was saying what David was saying. David was a man after God's own heart. And what does that look like? It's a godly confidence. And don't let anyone take that from you. All right. We have a lot of reading here, but it's very exciting. Let's be verse 32. Verse 32. All right. Verse 32, Bible says, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he's been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear come and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be just like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear would rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I can't go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag with his sling in his hand, and approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine with the shield bare in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was a little more than a boy, a boy with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog? Did you come at with me with sticks? And the Philistines cursed David by his gods. 
come here, he said. Now give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you defied. This day the Lord del will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his own head with his sword. Wow. wow. You read that, it's just got to get you fired up. And what's so amazing here, really what's the whole point of the passage is that our God gives us strength. Yeah. It really points to verse 38 when Saul said, bro, you need some armor right here. And David puts it on. Can you imagine it's like, I'm not trying to pick on people here, but can you imagine if Andre gave clothes to Bryce? You're like, bro, that's not going to work. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Andre is a little taller right there, and then you're not there. But, but so what was happening, he started to walk around this armor, he said, I don't, I don't need the armor. I'm just going to get these stones. And these stones are the things that are, uh, that's going to help me win this fight. And it shows that David was always ready to fight. He was ready. That, that's what it means to be a man or a woman after God's own heart. He was ready to fight. And he gets that stone and it hits Goliath. And then the stone gets into his forehead. And then when he sees, imagine the scene. He sees Goliath there on the ground takes the guy's sword, cuts his head off with his own sword, and walking around, and all the Philistines just, just all scram because they're so afraid of what God has done. But who did he give the glory to? He said, I want people to know that there is a God all around the world. And the Bible says the least of us is Zechariah. The feeblest of us can be like David. Imagine a church with people who have the heart of King David, ready to fight, ready to go, no matter what, even people are afraid. Because sometimes we could be like the Israelites, not like David, be afraid and I want to throw the stone. But David was ready to go and that's why we need to do it as a church family as well. Not for our own glory, so that people will know there's a God in the West region. So that people will know there's a God over there in the Southland region. There's a God over there at UCLA, at USC, at the Mingus Hills, at El Camino. There's a God in Los Angeles. There's a God in this world that you can find salvation in if you just follow him. Five stones. Why five stones? He was ready to fight. Bible says over here in 2 Samuel 21, 18 to 22. Jot it down. 2 Samuel 21, 18 to 22. Goliath had four brothers. Why did David get five stones? He said, if one of y'all tried me too, I'm going to throw this stone at you too. If one of y'all brothers, or one of those giants, did they come? This stone's coming for you too. He was ready to fight no matter what. He was ready to go. But, but th those giants, they run away because they saw that it was a divine victory. Their father, God, gave David the strength. But why, you ever think about it, why a sling? Why a rock? There's more to it. This is what I found. Saul, 1 Samuel 9, 21. Just jot it down. He was a Benjamite. Jot down Judges 20, 15 to 16. What were the Benjamites known for? Let me just read it to you. At once, the Benjamites mobilized 26,000 swordsmen from their towns, in addition to 700 able young men. Among all those, these soldiers were even 700 select troops who were left-handed, each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. 
the Benjamites were known for slinging stones. Saul had the talent. Saul had the ability. Saul knew he could do it, but he was just hiding. He didn't want to throw the stone. What stone are you not throwing? You hiding? Or are you ready to fight like David? Because God can't use a stone that's not thrown. At least David believed that he could throw the stone. And he's going to deliver him. What are you so afraid of? God's going to give you the strength. Some of you think we have this main character syndrome. He's like, oh, I'm David. No, some of you are the Israelites. You hiding. As opposed to fighting like David. God's going to give you the strength. How's the strength going to come? 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9 says, if you're committed, God will strengthen you. I'm not just talking about showing up to church, guys. I'm not just talking about showing up to midweek. I'm talking about committed to discipling, committed to changing, committed to the mission, doing whatever God, because sometimes we want to get strength first, then commitment. We do this a lot. We want the six-minute abs, the eight-minute abs. We don't want to go to the gym and, and actually do the hard work. It doesn't work like that in anything. So you've got to be committed and throw that stone. We need people to raise, we need people to just like throw this stone. We need people to raise on up and just do things. We want to see Metro Coast get to thousands of disciples. We need to help each other. I need you guys, you guys need me. We're not independent or dependent, we're interdependent. We need each other, family. We all need to throw the stones to the Goliaths in our lives because Satan is trying to destroy us. But it's so amazing when you study the Bible with people. And they just make a decision to allow God to give them strength. And, you know, today we have two guys who are going to come to be baptized. So we got Jacob and we got Josh, and they're right here ready to get baptized. And it's pretty amazing. You got to get to know Jacob and Josh. They're very different. Look at them. Um, <laughs> goes without saying. We're a church of all nations. It's been pretty awesome. But it's amazing when we study about with that. I got a chance to be in Josh's cross study and count the cost with him and just see this, the, 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 the transformation. It's just so incredible. And I want to encourage you, if you're studying the Bible, God's going to give you strength. It's going to be okay. He's your father. He loves you. But you just got to take that first step. God took 99. All you got to do is take one. You'll take one step. God's going to strengthen you. If you're studying the Bible, what are you waiting for? Follow these men. Get baptized as soon as possible. Not for the Christians. Remember how, how dramatically you changed? <laughs> right? We, we were just liars, immoral, Im impure. Two weeks, some of us just changed. It's like that. It's like two weeks. Like, whoa, like I'm just a different person. What happened? You vigorously study the Bible. So when you're not changing, what's happening? You're not vigorously studying the Bible and obeying it. It's just that simple. Christianity is really, remember what it said? We're not that smart, right? We're, 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 we're the, the, the fools. It's, just, it's for the fools. It's actually really easy to understand. It's just hard to do. I want to encourage you guys. We got to be committed and ask yourself, write it down. What have you been reluctant to throw that stone in? Where have you been reluctant to obey God? Because that's the only way God, our Father, can give you strength. Last point, very quick. Trust your Father's story. You know, after Goliath is slayed, the aftermath is David get some more haters. 18 and 19, 1 Samuel, I'm not going to read it. Saul now wants to kill David because he's, he's envious of him. He hunts him for 15 years. And yet, as we continue our study, we see that David trusts his father's story. He never wavers. And 
really, what was the key to this? We see in 1 Samuel 17, verse 26, and also he mentions the lion and the bear. He calls Goliath this uncircumcised Philistine. What is that referencing? Genesis 17, the covenant of, cir of circumcision. He's telling the guys, don't you remember the story? God chose us. We're the chosen people. Why are you afraid of Goliath? And then he said, I remember in the past how my father delivered me. He killed a lion and a bear. And he said, I know he's delivered me now. You know, God has a plan for every single one of us. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Do you trust it, though? Do you trust your father's story? Or are you trying to take that pen from your father? And do you, are you trying to write your own story? I can tell you right now, the glory of God's story is way better than the glory of yours. Because the glory of God's story is going is to end up with you being in heaven. And you know, turning 29 years old. Um, that's, that's me. I, I, I had some pretty bad allergies, so looking a little weird. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's my mom right there, and she's, cel she's celebrating her 60th birthday uh, next week on Saturday. And, you know, birthdays is really a great time to just reflect. Uh, reflect on what God has done in your life. And last night and, and this morning, I, I chose to do that as I prayed. And I just thought, wow, who am I? The son of Nigerian immigrants. Dad came here in the 70s. Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Went to Southern University. Mom came here in the 90s, and she just, just grinded just to help me so I can have a better life than they had. And my dad always told me the stories how, man, he just told me he grew up in a village in Nigeria. Didn't have his first pair of underwear until he was 13 years old. And he, just, he always grilled me about that. I remember that story pretty well. He said, you, you guys have it good. Y'all are watching TV. I had no underwear. <laughs> 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 that's, like, it, it, it put it in perspective like that, it's like pretty tough, you know what I mean? Like, okay, Dad, I got you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I think um, as exciting as it is to just reflect on all the things that God has done, you know, this, 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 this birth there, June is always a tough, a tough month for myself, though. Um, and this is the first time uh, my birthday landed on Father's Day. And um, you know, last night, looking at some pictures from, from, my, from my dad, and, um, you know, in 2018, my, my father passed away from cancer. And uh, he was a great man, taught me so much that I could be very grateful for, taught me discipline, character, hard work. I even got the opportunity to study, but I was with, with, with my dad. And uh, with actually the church leader who leads Ivory Coast, Blaze Fumba. He was there. But sadly, my dad didn't want to become a disciple. And we know as disciples, the eternal consequences um, for someone who doesn't become a disciple. And to this day, that's the toughest thing to have to live with. It's a thorn in my flesh. But I remember when it happened, I had to trust my father's story. Talk about my heavenly father. Every morning, I went to Malibu Beach, right next to Pepperdine University. And I prayed I had to sing first because my heart was so hard. Because I prayed and fasted. And I asked God, why didn't the story end off the way I wanted it to? But then through singing and praying, I got my heart there. And I realized, what was God trying to teach me? There's a scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. The Bible says, Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us all in all troubles. So we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. What was God trying to do in my, in my life? He wanted me to learn how to be a son to him and be comforted by him so that I could comfort others in any trouble. And I can look at that dark time and be grateful for it. Because it transformed me as a man. And it really taught me how to trust my father's story. I want to encourage us all. God has an incredible story for your life. 
I want to encourage you to pray through your, through your past and really see how God has delivered you. And God is still writing a lot of our stories here. But we could trust it. God has an amazing plan as long as we allow him to comfort us. So in closing, what is your perspective on God? Is he your father? He wants to choose you. Don't reject this. Don't reject him. His arm is extended. Just grab on. His arm is strong. He'll give you strength. And you could trust your father's story so that we could be a people after God's own heart. And to God be the glory. Thank you.